All right, let's jump in. Class recording has started. So, today, as it says up here on the board, yesterday we talked about how energy moves from one place to the other, how heat flows. And we talked about that heat naturally, energy naturally flows from things with high temperatures to things with low temperatures until they're the same temperature. That's still the case. This, today, we want to talk about how much energy is actually flowing from one place to another. Okay? So, that starts off with this picture. Okay? So, there's a picture of a guy eating a piece of pie. No utensils, just pick it up and, you know, chop it down. Okay? But, uh, I would say it's probably, um, it's probably apple, but... Could be, could be rhubarb, maybe, you know, so no, no rhubarb pitch, no rhubarb pitch. Could be lemon pitch, but let's go, let's go another route. It doesn't have to be pie, necessarily, okay? Uh, it could be... It's quiche. It could be quiche. It's it's like Although quiche is a little yeah, bit too much. There's a reason, so the one, the one thing I think it would be a better example would be like, um, if, uh, like you get a Hot Pockets or, um, or a pizza roll. Totino's pizza rolls, okay? Because regardless of whether you follow the directions on the box, every time you eat a Hot Pocket or a pizza roll, you end up burning the roof of your mouth. Is this not the case? Like every, like every single time, okay? Because of something that we refer to as specific heat, okay? If you take a look at this pie or your Hot Pocket or your pizza roll, there's basically two parts. You got the crusty part on the outside, and then you got the part on the inside, the filling part. Okay. The outside may be cool enough for you to pick up and touch, okay? But then when you go and bite into the inside, right, it's still like lava, right? Okay. So there must be something going on here with the outside versus the inside. And this idea is specific heat. When you cooked stuff. Let's say you went old-fashioned, old-school with your pizza rolls and actually cooked them in the oven. Okay? I know nobody does that because it would take forever and they're really not that good enough that you would spend 25 minutes to cook them. But let's say you did. Okay? When you put them in the oven, hot air surrounds your cold pizza rolls. Heat energy flows from the hot air into your cold pizza roll. Until what? Until they're equal, right? Thermal equilibrium. Until the temperature is equal. And then you take them out of the oven. When you take them out of the oven, is the pizza roll the same temperature outside and inside? No. Yes. Oh, uh, cool down. Ah. When you take it out of the oven, the outside crust and the inside filling are exactly the same temperature. They've been sitting in the same temperature oven for 25 minutes or however long it takes to cook them. Okay? But once you take them out of the oven, what starts happening? Yeah. They start cooling down. Right? Now, the outside has an advantage over cooling down in the inside. Why? It's on the outside, right? So the whole idea of conduction, right? It's touching that air, convection, the air is moving around it, all that other stuff. That, you know, obviously there's an advantage there, okay? But the outside and the inside are made out of different things, right? That, you know, the inside has like the kind of saucy tomato meat stuff, whatever, and the outside is more of the flaky crust. Okay. Those two things will cool down at different rates. So even though the outside may seem like it's it's cool enough to touch and cool enough to bite, when you bite into the middle of it, the inside hasn't cooled down as much as the outside. Okay? Because of something that we refer to as specific heat. So the specific heat of a material is defined as the amount of energy that is needed to raise the temperature of one gram of a material by one degree Celsius. So specific heat is the amount of energy that is needed to raise the temperature of one gram of a material by one degree Celsius. The specific heat of the material is important when you're talking about transfer of energy. 
because energy flows because of a temperature difference. But certain things will heat up and cool down faster than other things. So when we look at specific heat, the lower a material specific heat is, the more the temperature changes or the more the temperature is rising when it absorbs heat. Okay. But that also works the other way. So to summarize, things that have lower specific heat values end up changing their temperature rather quickly. And that goes when heating or when cooling. So materials that have lower specific heat values are easier to change their temperature. So if you let that pot filled with water sit on the stove under the gas burner for one minute, one minute, could you still put your finger in the water that's in the pot on the stove? Has it risen that much in one minute? No. But could you take the pot off the burner and touch the bottom part? No. No. Those two substances have been exposed to the same amount of energy, right? Heat has been flowing into them the whole time, okay? But the metal pot has a much greater change in temperature than the water does because they have different specific heat values. The metal pot has a much lower specific heat. Why would we want something like a metal pot to have a much lower specific heat? Because it'll heat up faster. It's going to heat up faster. Ultimately, Gabe, what do we want to get the heat? To the water. The water, because the pot isn't really cooking the spaghetti, right? The water in the pot is cooking the spaghetti. So we don't want to spend a whole lot of time heating up the pot, right? That's why pot and yogurt is made out of metal, right? But on the other hand, water has a very high specific heat value. As a matter of fact, there's not a whole lot that actually has a higher specific heat value than water does. It's one of the highest specific heat values that are out there. That being said, let's take a look at this picture again, right? There's our guy eating our pie with the hot filling, right? The filling of that pie or the filling inside your hot pocket or your pizza roll or whatever it is, right? Is going to stay hotter longer because that crust, or sorry, the filling has a higher specific heat value. Most of the filling is made out of water, right? If it's tomato sauce or whatever it is. So a lot of water in that filling. It has a high specific heat value. Mr. Schofield's rocking it out today. I don't know what he's doing. He's, he's, basically, he's basically been yelling since the beginning of the period, which is not that unusual. there? Let's talk about another situation. So let's say you go to the beach in the summertime, okay? So let's say you get to the beach in the afternoon, right? You get out of the parking lot, you take out your flip-flops, and you step on the sand. And what does it feel like? It's blazingly hot, right? So where do you immediately go? Go to the water. Or you could go to the shade, I suppose, but, you know, on the beach, there's usually not a whole lot of shade unless you bring your umbrella. Okay. But if you go to the water, right? Has the water been in the sun any less time than the beach has been in the sun? Has the water absorbed less energy than the beach has? No. They have absorbed the same amount of energy. But are their temperatures the same? Sand's a lot hotter than the water, right? Because water has a much higher specific heat value 
than the sand does. So its temperature is much easier to change than the sand's temperature is to change. Sorry. Water, high specific heat value, is hard to change its temperature. us here. Okay? We live by a large body of water. December, early January, it may be very, very cold here on the land. But has the lake frozen over yet? No. No. Why? Well, one, it's really big. But two, water has a very high specific heat value. It's been gaining energy all summer from the sun. So its temperature has increased. Just because we have one cold day here on the land, does that mean that the water is going to freeze? The temperature of water is hard to change. Now, that works sort of to our advantage in the fall and early winter because the water stays a little bit warmer. Well, sometimes it's advantage, sometimes it's disadvantage. Okay? The disadvantage part is we get lake effect snow because of that. Lake effect snow comes from the fact, do you guys know how lake effect snow works? Yeah, cool, air. Yeah. cool air goes over the warm water. Yeah, I drew a little picture. Not this picture. Oh, there it is. So, right? Here's some wind. On a cold day, we get lake effect snow. This wind blows over the warm water because it's still in the liquid phase. It's not boiling. But that means it's a lot easier to, you know, pick up, go into the air, okay? So this warm water, relatively speaking, goes, or the wind passes over this warm water and picks up a bunch of liquid moisture, okay? But then that liquid moisture blows over the land. That land that's now 15 degrees Fahrenheit. What happens to all that liquid water that's in the air? It turns into a what? It turns into solid, which we call snow, and it goes right there. Not usually on us so much, but you know, east side just because of the way the wind blows. Okay? And that's how lake effect snow works. If the water eventually freezes over, do we get as much lake effect snow? Because now this wind that travels over the water doesn't pick up as much liquid water. Why? Because there's not as much liquid water. Okay? So as the winter goes on, lake effect snow doesn't happen quite as often. But, on the other hand, that actually works against us. Because sometimes we get a really nice day in early spring. And instead of it being 15 degrees, now it's like 65 degrees. It's a great day to go outside. Okay? Except if you live where? Well, actually here's not so bad. But go north about a mile and a half to Bay High School. Ever been to Bay High School on a spring afternoon? Like you have to play like softball or baseball or something like that. Okay, it's freezing. Why? Because that water still hasn't warmed up yet. Yeah, it's 65 degrees here, but you're standing next to a lake that's pretty much still frozen. Okay, and Bay High School is only you know what a block away from the lake. It's freezing there in the springtime. Okay, people, you know, especially like if you come from farther south, you'd like Homestead Falls, right? It might be, yeah, it might be like 65 degrees in Homestead Falls. You got shorts on, you got a short sleeve shirt on, right? But you come north and go to Bay High School, and now it's 45 degrees. And you didn't pack any of those things because it was nice and warm when you left. So, but that works against us in the springtime. Okay. Mingo, were you going to say something or ask something? Uh, no, I, I said if you live on the, um, the port, mm. you know, like yeah. the port. Yeah, definitely there, yeah. And the closer, the closer you get to the lake, the worse it is. You know, we have a little bit of a buffer here, but, you know, Bay, Avon Lake, yeah, good stuff. All right, are we good with specific heat? It says down at the bottom of your outline,
when it comes to specific heat capacity, like I mentioned earlier, there aren't many there aren't many substances out there that have a much higher specific heat than water does. Okay? That has to go back to its structure. Right? What did we say that temperature was related to? What does temperature tell us about Gabe? The movement. Movement of the particles, right? So things that have high specific heat values is hard to get their particles to start moving. Water, water molecules have a lot of attraction for one another. Therefore, it's hard to get them moving. It's hard to change their temperature because of the attraction that they have for one another. But things like, I don't know, rubbing alcohol or hand sanitizer, right? How hard is it to change the temperature of this? Pretty easy. What do you do? Rub your hands together, right? That creates enough energy to turn this from a liquid phase into a gas phase, right? So different specific heat values. This, the alcohol that's in here, doesn't have as much attraction for the other molecules as the water does in other situations. Okay? Other weather stuff. If you go to the desert, right, you go to like Phoenix or something like that, right? So it gets really, really hot during the day. But as soon as the sun goes down, what happens to the temperature? It goes down. It can get really, really cold at nights, right? Places like Vegas or Phoenix or something like that, okay? Not usually in the summertime, but in the, you know, this time of year, it can be really, really warm during the day, but it can get down into like the 30s at night. I mean, there's big fluctuations in temperature. Because they're in the middle of the desert. What isn't there a lot of in the middle of the desert? Water. Water or rain, right? Sand is a lot easier to change the temperature of than water is. So you see big fluctuations in temperature. Okay? But if you go to places that are real close to the water, like San Francisco or something like that, okay? San Francisco never sees real big, well, I shouldn't say never. San Francisco rarely sees big fluctuations in temperature because they're surrounded by water, right? And that water is actually pretty deep, and it's actually pretty cold, so the temperature in San Francisco stays real constant. Not totally constant. It gets warmer in the summer and cooler in the winter, but it doesn't get as cold as it does here, but it usually doesn't get as warm as it does here because they have all that water around them. It's hard to change the temperature of Good there? Oh, would, just wondering, would this have anything to do with how the weather is here in Westlake lately? Not so much, other than the fact that, because okay, the lake isn't quite big enough to affect our climate, right? It affects, like, changes, like, every day-to-day -day kind of stuff, but not, like, long-term. But if the weather, the water overall in the world is increasing in temperature, which there's evidence to suggest that it is, okay, that's going to create bigger changes in weather patterns, like, overall. So, yes, it's, it, that does have a part to play with it, but not so much locally, more like globally. Does that make sense? Because even though our, the temperature, you know, greenhouse gases, global warming, that kind of stuff, how long is it going to take to raise the temperature of the ocean? going to take a long time. It doesn't just happen overnight because there's so much water and because water has a real high specific heat value. But gradually over time, the temperature of that water starts inching up, inching up, inching up, and that causes like bi those big weather patterns that we have are more results of temperatures coming from our big air coming from other places, not so much right off the lake. Does that make sense? All right. Now that we know that specific heat affects how much things change in temperature, let's talk numbers. Up here on the board is something we refer to as the specific heat equation, or I think on the back side it says measuring changes, calculating the thermal energy what does it say? transferred during an interaction. Okay. How much energy is actually transferred between two substances depends on a couple of things. So Q equals M times C times delta T. First, a couple of those letters you probably can figure out. What do you think M is going to stand for? Mass. Mass, okay. How big something is reflects how much energy it can absorb, okay. Delta T, 
what's T probably going to stand for here? Sure. Temperature, and the fact that it has a delta in front of it means what? Change. Not triangle, it means change, right? We talked about like slope in math class, like change in Y over change in X. You guys learned it that way? No. Yeah. Delta. Really? Here you go. Okay. All right. So first, Q. The Q represents how much energy is actually absorbed by a material. Now keep in mind that if we're figuring out how much energy is absorbed by something, if one substance or one object is absorbing energy, what has to be happening somewhere else? Something else has to be losing energy. Nate, how much? Um, exactly how much they're gaining. Exactly the same as the other one is gaining, that whole conservation of energy idea. Okay? So Q stand, it says here heat absorbed, and keep in mind that it could also be the heat released by something. M, that's going to stand for mass. Mass and measuring grams. Oh, Q. Because Q is energy, we measure that in joules, right? That's our unit for energy. The C value, that's the specific heat of that material. Okay? Specific heat has kind of a weird unit, right? It's written sideways here, but over here in uh, over here in dry erase marker, I wrote it here. It's joules over grams times degrees C. Okay? That's just there because it's measuring how much energy it takes to raise the temperature of something. Remember we said that was our definition of specific heat. And then the delta T, the change in temperature. Keep in mind that if we want to know how much the temperature or anything changes, we have to know where it started, and we have to know where it ends up. When you are calculating delta, the change in something, we always go final minus initial. So where it ends up versus where did it start. In this case, what is the temp what temperature does it end up with versus what temperature did it start with? is happening to this temperature? It's rising by 95 degrees Celsius. So what's that going to give us? That's not temperature final. This is what? This is the change in temperature. It says that the temperature is rising by 95 degrees. So Joe, it didn't actually give us a final temperature or an initial temperature. It just told us how much the temperature changes. Does that make sense? We don't know exactly where it started or exactly what it is now. We just know how much it's changed. Okay. Good there, for starters? OK. This is pretty straightforward, right? Q is equal to M times C times delta T. 
You know M, you know C, you know delta T. Go ahead and plug it in and find out what you get. So we go ahead. I honestly don't care. I'm, I'm going to check your final answer to see if you have the right unit on your final answer. Do you want me to do labels to show you how the final answer comes out the way that it is? Okay. So, yeah, I honestly don't care when you're doing your calculation. I just need an answer on the end. Okay. All right, anybody run this through their calculator yet? Well, hey, what did you get when you ran it through your calculator? Okay, so when you run it through your calculator, 21,327.5. Are you going to write this down in your test? No. You could write it down, but please don't make this the end. All right? Okay. So, first, Sivrin, back to your question. Okay? What are we calculating in this problem? Um, the energy absorbed by the material. Energy absorbed by the material. What unit do we use to measure energy in? Joules. Okay? So, this is going to have a unit of joules on it. And if we would have plugged in all, if we would have plugged in all of the units into the individual measurements, we would see that joules would be the only one left. But here, as long as you understand that energy is measured in joules, that's fine. Okay. But what else do we have to take care of? Sig digs, right? So here, okay, we said that significant digits are based on measurements. Is this a measurement? That's just a number that we know. That's a known value. Okay? So let's not worry about the specific heat value when we go to calculate the significant digits. That leaves us with two measurements, right? What are the two measurements that we actually made to do this problem? You know that the temperature goes up by 95 degrees Celsius and that you've measured 500 grams of this material. Okay? How many significant digits in the temperature change? This is two significant digits. How many significant digits here? One. That's only one, the way that it's written. Okay? On a test, I'd probably give you more than that. But on here, that's all I gave you. So that means we would round this answer to what? How many significant digits? One, one significant digit. So that would be what? 20,000. 20, is that the best answer in the world? Probably not, but like I said, on a test, that's what I would give you. Okay, you good? Very good. You good? Yeah. When we're multiplying and dividing, it's always the least number of significant digits. All right, good there? The second problem is a little bit harder, okay? Although not too terribly. So it says, one kilogram of frozen water at negative 5 degrees Celsius is placed on the stove. Water, as solid or liquid, has a specific heat of 4.18 joules per gram per degree C. How much heat is required to bring the water to a boil? First, what are we looking for in this problem? What is this problem asking us to solve for? How much heat, right? And that means that it's cubed, right? Well, hey, I heard you. I just so this problem is still asking us to solve for Q, right? It says how much heat. All right, things they gave us to work with. They gave us the mass, right? One kilogram or one thousand grams, right? Seeing as how this has to match the unit for that, so that's why we did it real fast. Gave two grams, okay? So this is going to be your mass value, right? What else? That's good. They gave us the specific heat of water, right? Specific heat of 4.18. So that's measured in, so that's, we use letter C to represent that. Make it, what else? Uh, it says the final temperature is boiled to. Okay, so this, water to boil, that means our final temperature is going to be what, Minga? 100. The final temperature of this water has to be 100 degrees C. Okay. Now, Joe, going back to a question from before, is that delta T? This is just the final temperature, right? Paige, what's the initial temperature? Negative five. Okay. They get told us that this is going to start at negative 5 degrees Celsius. So T initial 
is negative 5 degrees. Okay? Now, when we go to calculate, right, Q is equal to M times C times delta T, but to calculate delta T, we have to do a little bit of math first, right? So this equation would now look like this. To calculate delta something, it's always final minus initial. Okay? Does that make sense? Someone asked earlier today, does that mean we have to distribute that out? I said you could if you really wanted to, but if you know this and you know this, you can just calculate the value inside of those parentheses. Okay? And then go from there. Now, be careful. Because you can't change the fact that this says t final minus t initial. So if we start plugging things in here, right, we learned that our mass was 1,000 grams and that the specific heat was 4.18 joules over grams times degrees C. Now, make sure when you plug things in, what did we say the final temperature had to be? This has to be 100. Okay. Now we're subtracting the initial temperature. What was the initial temperature? Negative 5. So when you go and do this math, right, 100 minus a negative 5, what are you actually going to end up doing? You're going to actually end up adding 5, right? The change in temperature here is 105 degrees Celsius, not 95 degrees Celsius. Does that make sense? in mind as you're going through. Okay. Somebody run this through their calculator and tell me what you get. Mingo, what do you got? Uh, 438.9. What is it? 438.9. Mm. Make sure you change this. Make sure you change the mass from 1 into 1,000. Oh, I forgot that. Yeah. So it's uh, 438.9. Yeah, especially because especially we need to write, we got this grams here, and then this one shows up in grams too. We've got to be consistent with our units throughout the problem. Okay? All right. So that's what your calculator gives you. Now let's do some rounding, right? First, what unit has to be there? Joules, right? We're calculating energy. Okay? Then we go up here. We said, do we have to worry about this from a sig dig standpoint? A known value. We don't really have to worry about that. Okay? How many significant digits there? Two. That's two. Yeah, I know this says a thousand, right? But if this was our original measurement, we can keep that as two. Okay? Now, this is a little tricky because here we're adding and subtracting. Right? So we'd actually end up with this as being 105 degrees Celsius, which is how many significant digits? That's three, okay? So now we got two significant digits here, even though it doesn't really look like it. Three significant digits there, so our answer should have how many? Two. Two, okay? Probably the easiest thing to do here is to do what? Probably. I'd probably go scientific notation, because I wouldn't write that. would work just as fine as well. Good there? No. You're going to have to do this on the test? Yeah. Okay. Beth, go ahead. Um, I'm just thinking about where the thousand is. Okay. Probably not going to do, do this to you on the test, but so, but when we wrote this, we measured it as 1.0 kilograms, okay? Do you get that that's two significant digits? Now, we have to change it into grams in order to match the units on the specific heat. But just changing something from kilograms into grams shouldn't change the number of significant digits. Even though the way it's written now, this would only appear to be one, the original measurement had two, so that's why we keep it. I won't, do, I won't do that to you on the test. If Jump you want to change grams to kilograms, since the grams only has one, would you just not put the point zero on Yeah, that would be. That
that would be the same. Because then, like, same thing, Michelle. We don't change, just changing the unit on something doesn't change the significant digits. Because the significant digits were determined by the measurement, not by what unit we're using. Okay. All right, real quick, let's finish this up. On, uh, tomorrow in lab, you are going to use something that's called a calorimeter. A calorimeter is an instrument that measures changes in thermal energy. That being the case, if we're going to change thermal energy, we have to have something that's what and something that's what? Something that's high temperature and something that's low temperature. Okay. Here's a picture. Oh, uses the principle that heat flows from high temperatures to low temperatures until they both reach the same temperature. And Nate, we said earlier that that's the idea of conservation, right? That if something's gaining energy, something else has to be losing energy, the same exact amount. That means they end up with this, well, sorry, that doesn't mean, but they're going to end up with the same temperature. that's releasing energy, an exothermic reaction, okay? But that hot flows into something cold. There's water inside the calorimeter that absorbs the energy that is being given off, okay? The important idea is that, hold on a second, I finish almost done, that the heat that's released by something hot has to get absorbed by something cold. How much? Exactly the same. And we're going to use that idea tomorrow when we do some calculations in lab. Okay? Just one in. How does it, how can you do that with the styrofoam cup? The styrofoam cup is not absorbing anything or gaining anything. The styrofoam cup is to make sure that we're focusing on the stuff inside and not anything from the outside. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's what we got here. Insulation to prevent heat from entering or inside heat from escaping. Because we want to focus on the heat transfer that's going on inside that cup, not outside stuff. Maybe go ahead. Styrofoam has a very high specific heat. Most insulators do. Because we don't want their temperatures to change very much at all. Okay. I, that's what I was 